Welcome back everyone to our last video explaining the simplex method. So the first video we talked about what the simplex method is and how to set up the table. In our second video we found the pivot. So now that we've found the pivot we're going to teach you how to use the pivot. We're going to actually pivot to find the maximum for our situation here. So we had this information that we turned into this simplex table and we found that our pivot was three. So you can check out those videos if you need to see any of that for those details. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to use the pivot, this three that I have in this box here in the first row. We want to change all of the other entries in this pivot column to be zero. So I want to change this three to be a zero. I want to change this negative 90 indicator below the line to also be a zero. The way we'll do that is just with elimination. So I'm going to work down the column first. So the first thing that I will do is work on making this three in row two into a zero. We're going to do elimination with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and write down the row that I want to change. So the row that I want to change is row two. So I'm gonna copy that down. So that's six, three, zero, one, zero, 24. So if I'm eliminating the three here, that's the entry that I want to turn into a zero, the one right there. Um, I'm using the pivot row to change that by adding or subtracting copies of the pivot row to make this a zero. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and write down my row one. Now you'll notice I would need to change the sign, I think, of my pivot. Because if I just write down row one, then that's two, I have another positive three. We have one, zero, zero, 12. And if I simply add these together, then I'm going to actually not get zero, right? I'll get three plus three is six here, and that's not what I want. So I need to change the sign of one of them. And what we wanna make sure that we remember in the simplex method when we are pivoting is that whenever we want to change the sign of a row to do elimination, it needs to be changing the pivot row sign, not the other row. So if I'm changing row two here, I want this entry to be a zero, I need to change the sign of the pivot row. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply my pivot row, my row one, by negative one. So that will change all of the signs of my pivot row. And now when I add together, you see I, I will get zero as I intended to for that second column spot. So we'll get four, zero, zero plus negative one is negative one, one plus zero is one, zero plus zero, zero. 24 minus 12, that would give us 12. So this is our, remember we were changing row two, so this is our new row two right here. So we'll put that in the table. We'll replace this original row two that we had, and then we'll keep working down the pivot column, getting the rest of the column to be zero other than the pivot entry. Okay, so we've replaced our original row two with the new row two that we found. Looking at our pivot column, remember this is the column that we're reducing all of the non-pivot entries to be zero. So the only one left that needs to become zero is the negative 90. So we'll go ahead and write down the row that we're changing, which is our bottom row. So this is our row three. We'll write it down again, negative 80, negative 90, zero, zero, one, zero. And we're going to use row one, the pivot row, always to change that. Now, in order to reduce negative 90 to zero, I would need to add a positive 90 to it. So how would I get a positive 90 from this pivot? Well, I would need to multiply by 30 to turn this three into a 90. So I'm gonna use 30 times row one to reduce my row three. So if I go through and multiply everything in row one by 30 and then add it, so 30 times the two will give me 60 there, 30 times the three gives me a 90, 30 times this S1 gives me 30, 30 times these zeros will leave zeros still there, and then 30 times 12 will give us 360. So now we'll add these together. Remember the idea is we are trying to get this to be zero, right? So we get negative 90 plus 90, that gives us zero in the spot that we want. So we add these together and we get negative 20, zero, 30, zero, one, and 360. And remember we were changing row three. So this here is our new row three that we just found. So we'll go ahead and drop that in our table and then we'll look at what we have.
Okay, we've now dropped our new row three into our simplex table. We turn our attention back to the pivot column and we check and see that all of the entries in the pivot column besides the pivot itself, besides the entry three, are zero. So if all the other entries are zero, that means we're done pivoting this column. We have finished that process. So now we turn our attention to the indicators and we use the indicators to determine if we are finished pivoting and we can say what the maximum is at this point in time. Uh, so remember the indicators are all of the entries in the last row except for the final two entries. So this 1 and 360 are not included when we look at indicators. And we ask the question, well have we finished pivoting? We know that if all of the indicators are non-negative. So if you look at negative 20, 0, 30, and 0, you can see we still have a negative indicator there. So no, we are not finished in this case. And if we're not finished, then that means we need to find another pivot and we need to repeat the process. So for this one, it, since negative 20 is the only negative indicator, then I know that this is my pivot column. And if you remember how we found the pivot in the previous video, was that we then look at our constraint rows, which are all the rows above the line, and we take the entry in the equal column divided by the entry in our pivot column, and we get a result from that. So in this case, for the first row, 12 divided by 2 is going to give us 6 as a result for the first row. And for the second row, I take the equal column entry 12 divided by the pivot column entry 4. So we get 12 divided by 4, and that gives us 3 as a result. And I look at these results, and I say which one is the smallest positive number. So out of 6 and 3, 3 is the smallest positive number. So that tells me there that my pivot row is going to be the second row. So if I'm using the second row and the x1 column, that tells me that 4 is my new pivot, and I repeat the pivot process with the x1 column, so we'll do that right now. So my new pivot is this entry 4, and the entries above and below that in the same column need to be reduced to 0, the 2 and the negative 20 here. I'll start with the 2. So rather than multiply by a fraction and have to multiply this by half, I'm going to go ahead and double this first row. So I get a 4 that I can then combine with my 4 in some way. So I'm going to take row 1, which is the row that I'm changing, and I'm going to multiply it by 2. So that gives me 4, 6, 2, 0, 0, 24. And we use the pivot row to reduce. Um, so since I already have a positive 4 here, I will need to make this a negative 4. Remember, we change the sign of the pivot row if we need to change the sign of something. So I'm going to actually multiply row 2, my pivot row, by negative 1. That will give me a negative 4 so that I can add together and get 0 in the place that I want. 0, we'll get a positive 1 there. We'll get a negative 1 there. 0, we'll get a negative 12 on the end. If we add those together, we will get 0, 6, 3, negative 1, 0, and 12. And remember, we were changing row 1, so this is our new row 1 right here. So we'll go ahead and drop that in the table as our new row 1. Okay, so we've dropped our new row 1 in. The last thing that we need to do with that pivot of 4 is change the negative 20 also to a 0. So we're going to change row 3. So I'll write down my row 3, negative 20, 0, 30, 0, 1, 360. And how will I get rid of negative 20? I'll need a positive 20. So how do I turn 4 into a positive 20? Well, we'll go ahead and multiply our pivot row by 5. Multiplying our pivot row by 5 will give a positive 20. We'll add those together to get 0. 0, we'll have a negative 5, a positive 5, a 0, and then 12 times 5 would give us 60. So that's my pivot row multiplied by 5. If we add together, we get the 0 that we needed in this spot. 0 there, 30, negative 5, that would give us 25. 0 plus 5 is 5, 1 plus 0 is 1, and 360 plus 60 gives us 420. Remember we were changing row 3, so this thing here is our new row 3. We'll go ahead and drop that in our table and see what we have.
Okay, we've now dropped our new row three into our simplex table. Uh, we turn our attention back to our pivot column. You'll notice that all of the entries besides the pivot for itself are zero, so that means we're finished pivoting this column. And if you look at the indicators this time, you'll notice that all of the indicators are non-negative. So that means that we are finished. We don't have to pivot anymore. And now we're gonna talk about how you will read your solution from the simplex table. We will figure out our solution from the simplex table one column at a time. What we'll do is go through the columns and figure out which of the variables are basic variables. A basic variable in our table will have a column that has all zeros except for one entry. So if I look at this first column, this is basic because it only has one entry that is not zero, the four. Uh, the x2 has one entry that is not zero, the six. Uh, the slack variables, both of them have more than one non-zero entry in them, so these are not basic variables. The z is also a basic variable because it has all zero entries except for one as well. Uh, this is not a variable column, the equal column, that's just our constant column. So we have these columns, x1, x2, and z column, are basic variables. We'll give you a hint that in this process, z should always end up a basic variable. Uh, the others will depend on the, the problem that you're doing. And the way that we figure out what the values are for these basic variables, x1, x2, and z, it's very similar to the method that we use to find the pivot row, where we take the equal column and we divide it by whatever entry is in that column itself. So let's look at finding the answer for basic variable x1. So if I look here, the only non-zero entry is 4. So that's the only row that's going to give me any meaning. So I look at the row that has the 4 in it, the only thing that's not 0. I do the same thing that I did to find a pivot row, but that gives us actually our answer for x1. So I take the equal column entry divided by that column's entry, so I take the 12 divided by 4, and that gives me 3. So my answer for that basic variable, x1, is 3. That's our first answer. I'll go ahead and look at the x2 column now. So if we look at that column, the only non-zero entry is 6. So that's in the top row, so I'm going to focus on the top row. I take the equal column entry divided by the 6 in that column where x2 is, same idea as before. So I take 12 divided by 6, and that will give me 2. So that means that my answer for basic variable x2 is 2. If you look at z, which is the next basic variable column, so we look in the z column, the only entry is down here, and it is a 1, everything else is 0. So we look in that row and we take the equal column entry divided by the z column entry, 420 divided by 1, in other words, gives us 420. So that is z, by the way, z is our max, right, from our problem. So we already know our max there. All of the other variables are non-basic variables and their values for the solution for the maximization solution are zero so s1 and s2 in our problem here were not basic so their solutions are simply zero s1 and s2 equals zero so we have all of our values for every single one of the variables and now we can simply say since we know z is supposed to be the maximum it's the thing we were trying to maximize originally in our problem the maximum is 420 and that's going to be true when x1 is 3 and x2 is 2 S1 and S2 are both zero in this case. Uh, real quick, so if we describe what slack variable solutions mean, here S1 and S2 equal zero, since all the slack variables are zero, that means we used all the stuff, we used all the resources. So in our situation, that was all of the time on machines to produce these objects, if that makes sense. If for some reason S1 or S2 is not zero, then that means you didn't actually use all of the resources that you had available to you to produce the maximum. So for example, you know, if we had gotten a non-zero answer for one of these, that means we wouldn't have used maybe all of the time on one of the machines to produce our products, right? Or you, you know, in another situation, maybe you didn't use all of the ingredients to make your products. Um, so that's what slack variables are. They tell you if there was anything left over, basically, if that makes sense for your X variables when you got your max. In this case, we had nothing left over. We used all the time on the machines from our original problem. We're also going to upload in the near future some additional example videos so you can check those out, and hopefully we can help you get through your simplex problems. Good luck on your maximizing.